Thank you so much for being here today. Wendy gained national prominence in 2013 when she strapped on a pair of pink sneakers and held a 13-hour filibuster to protect women's reproductive freedoms in Texas. Her fight ultimately led to a successful and landmark decision in the U.S. Supreme Court, strengthening the landscape for abortion rights throughout the country. Wendy spent nine years on the Fort Worth City Council, focusing on the neighborhood economic development in her town, and she was elected to the Texas State Senate in 2008 in an underdog win. In the Senate, she frequently sponsored bills on cancer prevention, payday lending, protecting victims of assault, and government transparency. In 2011, she led the fight against a state budget that underfunded public schools by $5 billion, leading the Republican-led Senate to strip her of her position on the Education Committee. It was not the only effort to silence her. She narrowly won her 2012 election after almost a two-year battle in federal court, where she won a challenge to a Republican gerrymander redistricting that attempted to redraw her district and doom her re-election chances. Wendy is a proud mother of two daughters, Amber and Drew, and two granddaughters, Ellis and Sawyer. She's a tireless and tenacious advocate for women's reproductive, social, and economic equality. She um, founded Deeds Not Words to teach civic engagement to young women so they can use what they learn to organize, advocate for policy change, and increase voter participation. She knows no change comes without walking the walk. From her 13-hour filibuster in the Texas Senate to legislative efforts supporting the LGBT community, Wendy has pushed for progress again and again. And she's going to show us how to start pushing. So well done. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Pretty good. For me, coming from Texas, this is literally freezing fall here. <laughs> uh, but it's fun to be in the snow, too, at the same time. It's such a delight to be with you today, and I'm looking forward to the screening of the film tonight. I hope y'all are planning on going to that. I thought I would just start by talking a little bit about my own journey into the political world and why it is I feel so committed to helping the next generation of young women find their voice in the same way that I did. Um, I'll begin by admitting to you something that you might not expect to be the case of someone who spends their energy and passion as I do right now. When I ran for the city council for the first time in 1996, I was 33 years old and I was asked by one of the news outlets in Fort Worth, Texas where I was running whether I was a feminist. And I answered no. Um, and I answered no because I believed that to say I was a feminist immediately tagged me in a way that was charged, um, that sought to define me in a particular way that would be unbecoming. Um, and I also honestly had never really thought about whether I would apply that term to myself. What did that really mean? In my head, um, a feminist was Jane Fonda, um, Gloria Steinem, someone who was kind of on the front lines of fighting for women's rights, and I really didn't see my space in that yet. And what was really interesting about the way that I answered that question is that the very reason I had the opportunity to run for that city council seat in the first place, that I was in a position to be considered credibly for that race, was because of what all the feminists who had come before me had made possible, including women like my grandmother and my mother who would not have told you they were feminists either. My maternal grandmother is, was uh, Native American. My maternal grandfather was Irish. They had 14 children. They got married when they were 13 years old and 17 years old. Um, and they were poor their whole lives. They were tenant farmers who primarily traveled from the Panhandle area of Texas to the lower part of Oklahoma and also a bit in California. They didn't own their first home until they went on Social Security because it was the very first time in their entire lives that they had a stable enough income to demonstrate that they um, were eligible to get a loan. Um, 
My mother was one of only two girls that were born into that 14. They had 12 boys, which came in really handy in a farming family. Um, and my mother learned how to work incredibly hard um, from the moment that she had the opportunity to contribute, and that was very young. Um, my mom, my grandmother had only a sixth grade education. My grandfather had a fourth grade education. My mom was able to go through ninth grade before it was time for her to really take responsibility for doing more at home with all the other kids. And after my parents got divorced, when I was 10 years old, my mom became the sole financial support for our family. And she had never really worked outside the home before in a professional way, in a money-earning way. Um, so she went to work at Brahms Ice Cream and Dairy Store and um, earned the wages that a job like that allows. And what that meant for my brother, two brothers and sister and me, was that we went from living a fairly middle-class experience to living on the edges of poverty and the struggles that came with that. Um, I was always a really good student, and I was just absolutely sure that I was going to be the first person in my family to break through <coughs> the mold and go to college. <coughs> and then when I was 18, um, pardon me, I a little scratch there. <coughs> when I was 18 years old, I found out that I was pregnant. And I thought that my dreams of becoming that first person to do that in my family were going to come to an end. And they did for a while. Um, I got married. I went to work full time. I got divorced very quickly thereafter and really struggled. Um, like so many people in this country do. Couldn't keep my electricity turned on. Um, I knew the shame of going through the grocery store line and having to put things back because I didn't have enough money. Um, and I was really um, struggling to figure out how I was going to get past where we were stuck. I was working a full-time job and a part-time job. And I was really fortunate um, that one day one of the nurses that I worked with came into the office. Um, I was working for a pediatrician. She had this brochure um, from our community college because she was thinking about taking some business classes. And I picked up the brochure, and I saw that they had a program where you could become a paralegal in two years. And I talked to my employer about whether he would let me go early in the morning and come into work a little bit late. And then I also took classes at night. And that began my journey in the higher education world. And the wonderful and beautiful thing that I gained from starting on that path was I started to understand that I could do this. Um, and so I changed my ambition from becoming a paralegal to becoming a lawyer and um, was fortunate to get a scholarship to TCU in my hometown of Fort Worth. And then I was very fortunate to be accepted to and graduate from Harvard Law School. And that for me, as a person um, for whom college didn't even look like it was going to happen, was truly the greatest dream come true. But along that journey, um, it wasn't just that I had the capacity to take advantage of the kind of college affordability that had been made available by people who paved the way for that to happen. But I also had an opportunity, which is necessary if you are a mother trying to do that, and particularly a single mom trying to do that. I had um, access to affordable childcare. One of my dear friends who was a nurse in our office, who also had a baby about the same time, took care of both of our children. Um, my mom helped at night. I had, um, of course, my access to an affordable college tuition, but I also recognized that equally as important to me, I had access to the only health care I knew at a Planned Parenthood clinic near my home, and that clinic and the ability to receive contraceptive care there for me meant that I knew I could stay on that path to trying to get my college degree. 
So, when I answered that question years later, no, I wasn't a feminist. It was a, a view that really hadn't taken a step back and appreciated the battles that had been fought that paved a path for me. Um, and those battles had been fought by people who believed in the idea that women should be equal, um, and that not only should we as individuals have an opportunity to realize our best potential, but that we have something to offer, that the world is a better place when we are involved integrally in making decisions in the business, political, and social world. Um, so as I began the beginning of that um, political journey, while I may not have appreciated it at the time, and by the way, I lost that first race, um, I did come to appreciate as time went on how important some of the things that I was working on meant in the lives of women. Um, one of the things I was most proud of that I did as a city council person was I created a summer camp experience um, for hundreds of young people who were in the city council district that I represented, and then it expanded to a citywide effort. And these were kids who came from families like I came from, where their parents both worked, or if they were in a single family household, their mom or their single family dad worked. Um, and they didn't have the money to be put into any kind of daycare or schooling or fun recreational activities during the summer. And I raised all of this money in the private sector and then we matched it in the public sector. And still today, every year, that program serves seven, 800 children who otherwise would be left as latchkey kids during the summertime. And that was born from my own understanding of what it meant to be that kid and what it meant to be the mom of that kid later on. Um, and it certainly taught me the lesson that our experiences, when we bring them forward in the political framework, can be very, very important because sometimes it's not that people are callous or unthoughtful about those things, but just that it hasn't ever entered their worldview, so it's not something they're thinking to bring forward. When I was in the Texas Senate, um, and I won a Republican seat, I was the first Democrat ever to unseat a Republican in a gerrymandered district that was drawn very specifically to favor a Republican. Um, and when I won that seat, what a lot of um, well-meaning, strategic people said to me was, okay, you represent a Republican district, and so you need to go in there and basically be Republican light. Like, make your agenda reflective of that. But I wanted my agenda to be reflective of the values that were inherent in who I was and my life experiences. And my feeling about that was, I was honest about my values in the campaign, I was elected, and I'm going to bring those values forward. And it really informed my life experiences, informed the things that I fought for. Um, fighting against payday lending and the abuses in that industry was very personal to me because I understood what it was like to get trapped into those poverty um, cycles. Um, I fought against the electricity companies for lower rates, understanding from personal experience how an affordable electricity rate can make or break a household's ability to put food on the table. Um, I fought against um, high prices in the insurance industry for the very same reason. I fought for public education and funding of public education because of my own life's journey and the understanding of how important education had been for me to equalize my dreams. And then when the opportunity came to fight for women's reproductive freedoms, it was just natural for me that I would do that. And it wasn't just because 
I had had my own, of course, experiences with the support provided to me by Planned Parenthood and the health care that they provide, but also because um, years prior, I, believing honestly that I supported other women's right to choose abortion for themselves, I believed that personally I would never choose that for myself until I did. And I did, um, with a very much wanted pregnancy, post 20 weeks, where it is now illegal in my state, uh, when I discovered that this pregnancy that I wanted very, very much, this child that I wanted very, very much, um, was suffering from a fatal fetal abnormality called Dandy Walker syndrome. And what that meant was that the two sides of her brain um, had developed completely separate and had no connection or communication between them. Um, and if she survived birth, which my doctor said she likely wouldn't, um, and if she survived for any time at all, it would be a great deal of suffering. And I made the hardest for me decision I had ever made because my personal belief system um, wouldn't have chosen that for myself. But I did. And understanding that, um, and understanding how very personal that was for me, and my uh, feeling that a legislator stepping in and making that decision for me uh, felt like such a violation, I knew when that bill came back through the Texas Senate with an opportunity to filibuster it because we were at the end of the session and we had an opportunity to kill it by running the clock out, um, the deadline of the session out, there was no question that that's what I was going to do. In Texas, a filibuster is a fairly rare thing. It's not like in the US Senate where a filibuster means that you can join with a number of your colleagues and object to the passage of a bill at any given time because of their 60 vote rule. Um, for us, a filibuster could only be used when you were at the end of a session and the session was going to end at midnight and you were going to try to talk a bill to death before a vote could be taken on it before midnight. It was about preventing votes from happening. Um, similarly, in the way it works in the US Senate, but again, only allowed on that very, very end of a session. We were actually in a special session. Um, we had finished our session. We had failed to pass a very important transportation budget bill. And all of us agreed that we needed to come back in special session to do that. Um, calling a special session in Texas is only um, an authority that is allowed the governor and um, the legislature. We cannot reconvene ourselves for that purpose, and he called us back for that purpose. Rick Perry was our governor at the time. He was interested in running for president. Um, and about halfway through the session, he made a decision. It's a 30-day special session. About halfway through, he made a decision to add an abortion bill that we had killed in the regular session through a lot of procedural maneuverings, he made a decision to add that to the call. Um, with, I think we had about 16 days left. It ran through the regular process of going to the Senate chamber. It actually passed out of the Senate chamber after a great deal of debate went through the committee hearing process in the House and through the House calendars process. Um, I will tell you that our speaker of the Texas House, a Republican um, who made a decision not to run again this time, very purposefully allowed the bill to get slow walked through his chamber, um, through some procedural maneuverings that made the calendar stretch a bit longer on that particular bill. Knowing that by doing so, when it came back to the Senate, um, it would come back without very much time left on the clock. The only reason it came back was because the House made a change to it. Otherwise, it would have gone straight on to the governor's desk because it had already passed out of our chamber. 
But when a change is made to a bill by one chamber or the other, then it has to go back to that chamber for approval. And the change that was made was that they added the 20 meter ban to the bill. It was an omnibus bill. It had four pieces to it. Um, one of them was to very um, severely limit the way med medical medicine-induced abortions could be provided. Um, it required that abortion clinics had to meet the same standards as ambulatory surgical centers, which is absurd because it's not a surgical procedure. Um, and it required that doctors who provide abortions have to have admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of the abortion clinic. These things on their face sounded innocuous enough, and they argued, of course, that they were um, advancing them in the interest of women's safety and health. Um, but of course, we understood exactly what the consequence of passing those bills would be, and it would mean that most of our clinics would close. At the time, we had 42 clinics. If the provisions had all gone into effect, it would have taken us down to five clinics left in a state of 27 million people um, and a huge geographic footprint. Um, so the bill came back to us with the 20-week ban added, and they added the 20-week ban because I believe um, they felt like that was a stronger talking point for them. When you poll people on abortion and you ask them in America what their feelings are, the vast majority of Americans uh, support Roe versus Wade and women's legal right to have an abortion. But when you ask people about having a post-20 week abortion, because most people really don't understand the context of why anyone would ever do that, um, that feels like a bit much for them. And you start getting the opposite answer from people. And so to put the right message or window dressing around what they were doing, um, those who were really pushing to advance that bill in Texas added that provision to it. And then all of their communication about it became the 20 week ban without, of course, talking about the other parts. Um, we knew the bill would become ripe at 11, 11 a.m. on the last day of that session because it had passed out of the House chamber at 11, 11 a.m. two days prior, and our rules require that a bill has to lay out for 48 hours before it can be called. And at exactly 11, 11 a.m., the lieutenant governor called that bill up on the Senate floor and I was prepared uh, for what I knew would be 13 hours ahead of talking. The preparation that I did for that was to work with other Democratic offices and to compile binders and binders filled with materials to read from. We joked that we truly did have binders full of women um, <laughs> because we had compiled the stories of so many women who wanted to share their perspectives on this law. Um, I prepared by eating a single boiled egg. I was afraid to eat too much because I wasn't going to be allowed to leave the floor to go to the restroom. Um, I didn't drink a lot of water either, though I was very worried about having a Marco Rubio, did y'all remember that really dry mouth moment he had in an interview once? Um, I was worried about that. Um, and I prepared by having a doctor come over early that morning and insert a catheter. Um, and I had a catheter bag on my leg because you aren't allowed to take a sip of water, eat a bite of food, lean on your desk, and you're definitely not allowed to leave to go to the bathroom. Um, so that was my physical preparation for the day. Um, and what really became extraordinary about that day, and the, truly the only thing that made it extraordinary, didn't have anything to do with what I did. It was the fact that in a state where we tend to give up before we even begin, uh, where we understand that the deck is stacked very high against those of us who are fighting for progressive ideals um, and who have seen time and time again that these decisions are pre-made, a fait accompli, 
uh, we've developed an attitude of kind of giving in before we even start. And this was actually, even though filibusters are rare, because the opportunity for them is rare, this was actually the second time I had filibustered a bill. The first one, um, two years prior, was to try to stop five and a half billion dollars from being cut from our public schools. Um, and in that instance, we didn't have a whole lot of people show up at the Capitol, you know, maybe a few hundred. Um, and I expected that this day was going to be like that as well. But for whatever reason, it wasn't. Um, people, and I really think social media played such an important role in this, um, Twitter particularly. Um, more and more people around the state were seeing come across their social media feeds, what was going on. Um, people who had gotten up that morning with absolutely no intention of finding themselves in the Texas Capitol later that day were finding themselves getting in their car, leaving work, leaving school, um, and making a pilgrimage, literally, from all over the state. And before the day was halfway through, there were thousands of people who were there. Um, and what was so extraordinary it was the first time in the history of the Texas Capitol, and if you know anything about Texas, we like to brag that everything is bigger and better. Our Capitol really is the largest um, state capital in the country, and to fill it to capacity is quite a feat, but it did fill to capacity, and DPS closed the doors as a consequence, and still people came um, and spilled out all over the Capitol lawn. And as I was engaged in the work of what I was doing, I could tell that something extraordinary was happening. I could feel the life that was in the building. And certainly, the Senate gallery um, had been full all day long. Um, but what really made it special was that my colleagues um, began doing something that had never happened in a filibuster before in Texas. They began trying to shut it down by finding reasons to call strikes against me. If you don't stay germane to the topic of a bill in Texas during a filibuster, you're violating the Senate rules and one of your colleagues can call you on that. You're allowed to be called out three times in violation of that rule, and if you hit the third violation, then the filibuster comes to an end. No senator ever in the history of filibustering in Texas had ever even had a single strike called on them. I had not had a strike called on me during my education filibuster. Um, but on this day, the Republicans had met and determined together a strategy that before the clock hit midnight, they were going to find strikes and bring the filibuster to an end. Now, keep in mind that previously, when other senators had filibustered, they were allowed to just read names out of a phone book, just page after page of names to fill the time. The argument being that all of these people lived in Texas and all of these people were going to be impacted by whatever the legislation was and therefore it was germane to read all of their names and that was considered acceptable. I was called uh, for strikes, for example, talking about the prior session's limitation on women's reproductive freedoms and how building upon it with this legislation was going to create um, an inability to access abortion care as a cumulative impact, that was considered not germane. Um, I was called for a strike because my back started hurting and one of my colleagues, as I continued to talk, was helping to put a back brace around me. There's a rule that you cannot be assisted by another senator during a filibuster. What that intends is that you're not supposed to take turns talking. If you're doing it, you're supposed to do it. Uh, but one of my colleagues called a strike and the lieutenant governor ruled that that was a legitimate strike. Um, and then the third one had to do with me talking about the history of abortion care um, under Roe v. Wade as somehow this was not germane to the conversation that we were having. Um, and the third strike uh, was called at about 
10, 15, 10, 30. And then we began debating the ruling. And the reason that we killed the bill was because of all the people who came. And it started uh, when one of my Senate colleagues, Leticia Vanderpute, who had been very frustrated that she wasn't being recognized in this parliamentary debate, finally, after the ruling, she was recognized and she asked the question, Mr. President, at what point is a woman's voice or raised hand to be recognized over those of her male colleagues in the room? And when she asked that question, obviously it was pertinent in that moment, but the larger meaning of that question was not lost on anyone who was there. And it just lit this fire with the people who were in the gallery, who'd been very observant of decorum throughout the day, in spite of how frustrated they were getting. And they began screaming and pounding their feet. And then that spread into the hallways and up and down every level of the rotunda where the thousands of people were in that building. And within moments, the whole building was one huge thundering noise um, of democracy, of what it means not just figuratively to add your voice to public debate, but literally to do so as a citizen, not just as an elected official. Um, and it created so much chaos. Um, if you go to the movie tonight, you'll see there's a little snippet in the film of women being dragged out of the chamber by DPS officers. Um, and amazingly, even though the vote was called and the Secretary of the Senate began taking the vote, that last vote didn't come in until 12.03. And at least in the moment, for that moment, we killed the bill. Now, a second special session was called, which is the same thing that happened with my education funding filibuster. I killed the bill. Another special session was called. The bill came back. The bill passed into law. And I knew that the potential, the likely potential of that happening would happen here. But for me, the fight was worth waging, if anything, just to fight because we knew it mattered so much and to raise awareness around the state that this was happening in their capital. Because all too often, things happen in our state government where we don't have MSNBC and CNN covering every single thing that happens, and people are just unaware. So they don't ever know to be upset or to react to it at the ballot box. Um, and I wanted to make sure that people understood what was happening on that issue on that day. Um, the bill did pass into law when the second special session was called, but it really, did something for us in our state. Um, we came to really have a stronger understanding of the power of our voices. Um, and it really has sustained itself. Uh, we had 130,000 women show up at our Women's March a couple of years ago, which was extraordinary for us. Um, and we've seen so many um, progressive efforts and organizations grow up underneath that as well. One of them um, being the organization that I founded after my unsuccessful bid for governor in 2014. I founded it almost three years ago, deeds not words. And I founded it because I wanted to use my experiences and understanding about how to effectively fight within a legislative process and teach that to high school and college age young women. And so that's what we do. We have chapters all over the state. Um, our young women in the 2017 legislative session passed seven bills into law that they um, helped to create to advocate for, they came to committee hearings and testified, and they made a powerful change. Um, and it was so gratifying for me just to see them 
come to an understanding of how very powerful they can be when they weigh in and use their voices and bring their personal stories and experiences forward in a way that informs thinking and decision making. Um, and so that's what I'm doing now. The very good news about the bill that passed, even though it did go into effect, um, it was only allowed to partially go into effect while the courts were analyzing the legitimacy of it under the Constitution of Roe v. Wade. But even with only the partial effect, over half of our clinics closed. Those that remained open were only in the large urban areas of the state, and women in far south Texas, the Rio Grande Valley, and in far west Texas, El Paso, Lubbock, Amarillo, um, they lost their access to abortion care. And unless they had the financial capacity to travel and endure overnight hotel stays, because we do have a 24-hour waiting period in Texas, um, then that meant they lost their access completely. Their stories formed a really important part of the Supreme Court um, document documentary evidence about why the law actually hurt, not helped women's health. And it really was because they brought their personal stories forward that the Supreme Court overturned the law. Um, so that's the good news. The law is overturned. Not only was it overturned, but it gave the Supreme Court an opportunity to further define the limits of what states are allowed to do when it comes to constraining access to abortion care. Um, so it left its imprimatur all over the country, which was very gratifying for all of us who fought that battle. Um, but in spite of it passing into law, of the more than 20 clinics that closed when it went into effect, only three of those have reopened. Um, and it's been almost three years since that was overturned. And it just speaks to the fact that it's very difficult um, to reopen these clinics once they do get closed, both financially, um, but also to staff them. There are so few abortion care doctors that remain in this country um, that it means they have to try to spread themselves um, throughout the country to provide this care. And you're going to meet uh, one of those doctors. Um, you'll see her in the film, and she'll be there tonight to talk as well. And she travels between three different states providing abortion care. Um, because the need for it and is so great and the number of doctors who are doing it are so few. And that's really been one of the things that has kept those clinics from reopening in Texas because we lost those medical professionals to other places and it's just hard to get them back. Um, I feel very hopeful actually about the landscape of where we are. I feel hopeful because people in your generation are so much more engaged definitely than I was when I was in your, when I was your age. Um, and you are bringing forward in a much more um, astute and aware way uh, what you all would say, woke, that's my daughter's saying, you're woke. Um, you're bringing your understanding about the importance of these things forward in the candidates you support, in your understanding of how important it is that you exercise the privilege and the power of voting. Um, and politicians, bit by bit, are going to gain a greater, greater, greater and greater understanding of the fact that they're going to be held to account if they continue to go down this path. So far, it's benefited them. And you're going to see that from the film tonight, too, which does a really good job of delving into how abortion became the political hot potato that it became. Um, there's been reward for taking the positions that the anti-choice movement has taken. But I can feel a groundswell of a counter um, response to that that's, I think, going to really, in the long term, assure that we continue to maintain the rights that we have today. So, I probably talked longer than you wanted me to. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's very interesting. 
Um, do we have questions? And um, I was hoping that some students would talk about what they're passionate about, and maybe you could make some comments about how they might move forward with that. Yeah. Like what issues are they most passionate about? Yes. Um, my name is Cassie. I'm from Austin, Texas. Oh, wonderful. It's a bit of a personal message in a public venue. But uh, I, in high school, I wrote an essay for the JFK Profile and Courage Competition by your filibuster, oh, and it placed nationally. So That's I'm so really cool. moved to be here. Will you share it so with thank me? Thank you. I absolutely I would love will. To it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you came, Cassie. Yeah, yeah. I'm really happy to be here. What year are you in? I'm in 2022. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't think I can follow that one. <laughs> um, you mentioned the use of social media and how it was effective for your cause. Um, I, that really uh, sort of hit me because yesterday, um, after the um, New York legislative victories, mm -hmm. um, there were multiple people, too, in particular, um, who I like know and respect from my parents' generation. Um, who uh, were writing on Facebook about sort of the tragedy of, of this like expanded abortion mm -hmm. access. Um, one of them has just had a child and posted a picture of his son at age like one hour. It was like up to one hour before this picture was taken. It would now be legal in New York to murder him. Not true. Um, and and another one uh, was saying that people are like applauding abortions and I just um, I, I have never responded politically on Facebook to people um, and I came about as close as I've ever come <laughs> and I was curious like what um, what do you see as like productive responses to um, to positions held in like our, our own social circles perhaps yeah. expressed on social media it's a really good question. I, it's hard on social media. Um, social media is really great about raising awareness about things. Um, it's not necessar necessarily the best platform for having a debate about things because it creates such a safe space for people to act a lot uglier than they might if they were sitting across from you and you were inviting a reasonable conversation to take place. It gets too inflamed too fast. Um, but I, I have found that the best place to try to help shape understanding and maybe not necessarily change someone's thinking, but influence it so that it is more nuanced is through the sharing of personal stories and experiences that will help them if they have the willingness and capacity to empathize with lives that are different from their own, may come to appreciate things in a different way. That was really how marriage equality became the law of the land. It was a slow and steady shaping and personalizing of relationships that were not heterosexual. And the fact that those relationships are no different in their love and support of each other than a heterosexual one would be. There was a strategic decision made to stop talking about marriage equality as um, an issue necessarily of equality under the Constitution, but instead to talk about it in more human terms. Um, this is my partner who I've been with for you know, three years, 10 years, six months, whatever. We love each other um, and we want to provide the same kind of support to each other in a marriage that others are allowed. And when the conversation around marriage equality became more about human beings who love and care for each other and simply wanted the same traditional bounds of marriage that others were able to have, that it started moving the conversation. Um, I told you all earlier that my own 
thinking about whether I would choose abortion for myself had always been that I wouldn't. Um, I shared with you that I had a child when I was 18. And the thought of having an abortion never entered my mind. But I did have a full appreciation for the fact that other people ought to make that decision for themselves because it is such a personal one. And I think the more and more we are destigmatizing abortion and we're coming forward and we're sharing our stories about it, and the more that understanding is shaped about why and when and how women come to make that choice, it helps to nuance it and make it less so black and white in people's minds. I think there are really kind of three camps of people when it comes to this issue. There are people like me who believe it's a personal choice and ought to be completely outside of government intrusion. Um, there are people on the opposite end of that who believe very uh, sincerely that life begins at conception and abortion is a taking of life and that it is a moral wrong and should not be allowed. Those are kind of the two ends. Um, but there's this whole other one. And, and by the way, people who are here, the other end of what I believe, I can have sincere um, and thoughtful conversations with. And I really respect what their thinking is and what their position is guided by that thinking. Then there's this other camp. The other camp are the people who really don't care. Um, and in fact, a lot of people in this camp believe that abortion is just fine. Um, they've had an abortion themselves or they have paid for an abortion or been in partnership with someone who's had an abortion. Um, and they are the vocal opponents of abortion. And they're vocal opponents of it because it has been a political ploy for them to advance their own political interests. That camp cannot be persuaded. And I have long ago determined not to waste my breath trying to debate someone who sits in that position. Because we're in, they're there. They're not in a position that really is thoughtful on this issue, and therefore you persuade them on the terms of the issue itself. They are self-interested, and they're throwing women's bodies under the political bus for their own advancement. You're going to see from the film tonight that there was a moment, a strategic and decisive moment, when a certain part of the Republican Party determined that for its long-term viability, uh, getting in line with the evangelical anti-choice movement was the way to create sustained viability. And that decision shaped the Republican Party going forward. That does not mean that every person who is a Republican um, thinks like this camp does, and I don't want to leave that impression. Um, but it has been a, a very thoughtful part and effective part of the strategy of leaders of the Republican Party to maintain power, both at the federal level and in state houses around the country as well. So, hi. Yes. Hi, I remember you from the yeah, from um, everyone else. I'm Katie. Um, so, like you said, a lot of times um, people try to put restrictions on abortion is supposed to be like for the woman's health. And I was wondering, how do you fight against medical misinformation like that about abortion and its effects? You really have to rely on that happening in the judicial process. Um, and what you hope is that you will have a judge who is going to look very fairly at whether there is merit to that argument or not. Um, so for example, in the case that we overturned, the whole women's health case that came out of Texas, um, there was a lot of medical information that was provided to the Supreme Court in their decision making to help them see that this had 
there was no basis in science for the argument that this was going to improve women's health care. Um, thankfully, ACOG, which is the Academy, American Acad Council of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, they came forward very forcefully with a position that this actually harmed women, did not help them. Um, and a number of other medical community perspectives helped to inform that debate. And then, as I said, um, and again, back to using stories to persuade, there were hundreds of women who filed um, through the help of lawyers, amicus brief, friends of the court briefs on that case, who had been impacted by the law in Texas and who were able to tell the personal story of how their health had been compromised, not helped by the law being in effect. And we were lucky that Justice Kennedy was still sitting on the court and that he was open-minded and um, objective enough to really fully weigh all of that information and to determine that the guise, the excuse of doing this for women's health was really a sham. And in the opinion that was written, um, the court was very strong about saying that, that it was clear this was a ploy, um, that um, it in no way advanced women's health in our state, and that the court was not going to entertain um, laws, no matter how vociferously someone argued that it was on behalf of women's health, if they couldn't put in front of the court a legitimate, demonstrable um, relationship between that law and the advancement of women's health and well-being. And so that was the way in which they kind of solidified um, prior court opinion that hadn't really spoken nearly as strongly on this particular issue. It had always been the case that a state wasn't allowed to pass something in the interest of fetal life um, if it created an undue burden on a woman's access to abortion care. But this case really kind of put the guardrails around that in a very important way and was uh, very descriptive in what the expectation would be in terms of how a state would be required to show that it did not create an undue burden. Um, and so for that, I'm, I'm almost grateful um, that the case, that the law passed, that it went to the Supreme Court, because it did ultimately shape the landscape of what will happen in the future in a very positive way. And unless and until the court determines to unwind that or um, unwind Roe versus Wade in its entirety, then it's going to continue to keep those guardrails around what states are allowed to do in a really important way. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm also Katie, and I'm also from Texas, so I'm so happy you're cool. here. Um, but so well, I know there's, Texas, uh, Houston. Um, there's a lot of, like, I know there's a lot of excitement around, like, um, the statewide candidates this past fall, um, and we got closer to having Democrats win. Do you see the path forward to, um, like, Democrats winning statewide, particularly the lieutenant governorship? And if so, like, how do you think we need, like, should be getting there, basically? I do see the path forward. Um, our statewide offices, as you know, um, are up in midterm election cycles. It makes it harder because the turnout is not nearly as high in the midterm. Um, this midterm, Texas was not an exception in the fact that we had an extraordinarily high turnout. Um, people were just so anxious and excited to express their opinions after the 2016 election. And so the climate was really good in the sense that people were self-motivated to turn out and to be engaged and to make sure they were using their voices in elections. Um, if we can sustain that kind of energy and involvement in the electorate, then sooner rather than later, I do believe we're going to win a statewide seat. Uh, 
We haven't won a statewide Democratic seat in Texas since 1994, uh, when Ann Richards lost her seat. But we did have one statewide who won that year. I think he was the agricultural commissioner or something like that. Um, so it's been a very, very long time since a Democrat has won statewide there. But things are changing, um, and you probably both know this coming from Texas, that a correction occurs when things are getting too extreme on one side or the other. Um, and things have gone to such an extreme on the conservative side in our state that a lot of what I call kind of the traditional business Republican who would say to you, I'm a fiscal conservative but a social moderate, um, that person is beginning to vote for Democrats um, in a way that they probably wouldn't have conceived of themselves doing even you know, five years ago. So I, I think it's coming, yeah, pretty soon. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you. Um, while you were talking about your filibuster, you spoke about your rela relationship with the Republican senator and how you guys had such respect for each other. Mm -hmm. In an era of extreme partisanship and gridlock, do you, what do you see as ways to move forward and become more bipartisan? Some of it is really the rules which you operate under. So Texas used to have a rule. It was in place from the very beginning of the Texas Senate. Um, and our lieutenant governor did away with it last session, newly elected lieutenant governor. But this rule was a two-thirds rule, sort of like the US Senate operates, where in order for a bill not just to be voted out successfully, but in Texas, in order for a bill even to come to the floor for debate, two-thirds of the body had to agree to allow it to do that. Um, and that meant that so long as one party held at least a third of the seats, then you had to work together because it took bipartisan support for bills to come forward. And that's how we had always functioned. So even when Democrats were a majority of the Senate chamber, Republicans had always held enough votes to force that cooperation. Um, and then when we flipped and became a majority Republican state, the same thing was the case. And the good news about that was, and you know, you hate that it's a forcing that, that creates this, but your relationships with your colleagues are formed by necessity. Um, and you set aside those partisan barriers that are otherwise erected, and you work together because you need to, and you find that you actually like each other, that you agree on so much more than you disagree on. And um, I was really proud to pass so many bills on a bipartisan basis when I was in the Senate. Then when that rule was undone by Dan Patrick, who became our Lieutenant Governor um, four years ago, it created a dynamic that completely changed the way the Texas Senate operated and it became uh, a very partisan extremist uh, chamber. And the bipartisan work that had been done for all those decades and decades before really was just obliterated. The good news is that in this um, special election, or excuse me, midterm election, even though we didn't take a majority of the House or the Senate in Texas as Democrats, 12 House seats flipped, two Senate seats flipped, and in other races, they were really close and almost flipped. And it was a wake-up call to a lot of the Republicans that that agenda that they'd been driving that was getting you know, further and further to the edge of the extreme, there was a correction that was happening by the electorate responding and saying, we don't like this, we're replacing you. Um, and that was happening even though these districts were very gerrymandered Republican districts, they were still losing them. And so it changed the dynamic of how they started this particular legislative session. 
and some of the more controversial items like the transgender bathroom bill and trying to do away with um, or actually trying to pass private school vouchers in our state they were immediately taken off the table this session because there was a correction that voters created. Um, and I'm curious, really, to see whether that's going to extend to some of these anti-abortion bills. There have been some filed, the sessions you would expect. Um, but how much build underneath them, how much the lieutenant governor and the speaker of our house chamber will allow them to progress is going to be really interesting to watch. Do they feel like voters were correcting them even on women's issues? Or do they still feel like that's a political wedge that's more reward than burden and it's worthwhile for them to continue inflaming that. I don't know. Time will tell. We just started the session a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Uh, I'm Kelly. I'm from Dallas. Um, I love that all these Texans are here. <laughs> this isn't a question. It's just a similar note. Like I know um, during the midterm elections when in my district Pete Sessions lost and call on the right one. There's just a really exciting moment because like if you'd asked me like a year or two before, like I would have told you for sure that Peace Sessions would have won. Yeah. So it's kind of an exciting time to see like even though we lost like the gubernatorial race yeah. and the Senate and like that <coughs> house in total, like it's kind of cool to see um, seats turning blue and like yeah. my district, which I like it's really gerrymandered. Like we, no one would have expected Pete to Pete Sessions to lose. That's right. But it's just a really it's like okay. cool thing to see. He had been there for, I think, 22 years. A long time. Um, and this extraordinary young man, Colin Allred, ran against him. And uh, it's a very affluent district, um, majority white. Colin is African American, um, self made, raised by a single mom who is a school teacher and a school administrator in that district, um, played professional football. Uh, went to law school at Berkeley after he got hurt and couldn't continue his football career. Worked in the Obama administration, um, and just you know was kind of this perfect foil for for his opponent Pete Sessions. Um, but it was really exciting to see that the voters lined up behind him in the way that they did. A lot of people who would probably voted Republican their entire lives, but they saw him as someone that they felt good and comfortable with, and I think he's going to have a great congressional career. It's really special. Yeah, thanks for helping with that. It's awesome. Yes? Hi. Um, so my name's Jake. Um, I'm not from Texas, but I'm actually from Rhode Island, which I think was where you were. I was born there, yes. Yeah. Um, so I have like two questions that are kind of interconnected. So my first one um, is about kind of the Latino vote in Texas because I know that um, Hispanic voters are a big demographic and one that um, you and Congressman O'Rourke had I think struggled a little bit with. That's right. So I was sort of wondering if you think that there's like a potential there in statewide elections and then I was also wondering more generally about like whether fair redistricting like could be achieved in Texas. Um, I wish I could say very optimistically, yes, fair redistricting. No, okay. um, we're going to have to get more balanced in yeah. our elected representation before I think we can legitimately have that conversation. Okay. It's, it's creating too much of a reward for those who are currently in power to keep the current drawing of lines, a very political drawing of lines in place. Um, yeah. So I don't hold out hope that it'll happen soon, mm -hmm. um, but I still think it's worth striving for and continuing okay. to drive the conversation about, because regardless of which side is holding the majority of power, I think most Americans would say they want lines to be drawn in ways that reflect who we are as communities and not yeah you know, where we're choosing our voters, but we're voters, obviously are choosing elected officials. Um, and what was your first question? Um, about kind of like the Hispanic vote. Oh, the Hispanic vote, yes. Um, 
It's historically very low in Texas. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because demographically we look like California, almost exactly. Yeah. But the participation of the Latino community in California is very different than it is in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people point to a decision that was made in California years ago that had a dramatic impact on the Latino community in terms of their ability to work and contribute to the economy there and the backlash that was created as a consequence of that. Um, I haven't seen the statistic in terms of what the increased Hispanic turnout was for Beto's race, for example, versus 2014 when I ran. I know it was a definite increase. Oh, okay. That's right. um, but there's a lot of effort that is being spent on trying to continue to encourage that voice. And, awesome. and part of it is just helping people to believe that their vote actually is going to make a difference. Um, and also just helping to connect for people who are politically um, attuned, the understanding between electing someone and an outcome in our lives is a direct corollary. But for some people, and I was certainly in this camp um, in my younger days, you're so busy just trying to survive that yeah. you don't even you don't even know uh, what the political decisions are. You certainly aren't making connections between those decisions and what's happening in your life. Yeah. So, for example, um, in 2011, 120 million dollars was taken from women's health care specifically to try to hurt Planned Parenthood, and we had over 80 clinics, women's health care clinics in Texas, close. None of them was providing abortion, um, and most of them were in communities where women didn't have access to any other kind of health care. We do have the highest uninsured rate in the country as well. Yeah. Um, and so people lost their health care, and they knew that. They knew their clinic closed, but they had no idea that it was a politician's decision in Austin, Texas that made that happen, right? Yeah. They felt the impact of it, but didn't understand that they were actually empowered to do something about it by voting somebody else into office to change it. Yeah. And that's our job as people who care about these things and who believe in the power that each individual voice brings in public discourse and certainly at the ballot box. It's our job to help just person by person by person have these conversations and hope that we lift understanding and individual empowerment by doing that. Um, and it's one of the things that we're doing with Deeds Not Words. We joined with another organization which is aimed at the um, increasing the voice and power of the young Latinx community. Um, and we came together and created something called Movement Mojeras, which is a movement for women. Um, and we are doing deep dive leadership training of 25 young women of color in two year cohorts um, around the state with the hope that as we help um, grow the leadership skills of some of these young women. They will use those skills to organize their own communities and lift the voices of their own communities by doing it. Um, it's slow work, but it matters so very much. We can't decide that it's so hard that we're just not going to do it, right? Um, so, bit by bit by bit, we'll see if we can get there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You mentioned that uh, the woman you worked with helped seven pieces of legislation be passed. Would you mind telling us about the content of those? Things? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I really tried to, to do is to make sure that the agenda that we're working on, number one, is one that's incredibly important to the young women who are bringing it forward. But number two, um, doesn't necessarily carry the same partisan charge to it that other issues might. Um, so for example, we did not spend time with our high school and college age young women trying to get them all fired up about going and overturning every abortion law that had ever passed in Texas, knowing that what that would mean for them was that 
they wouldn't even get a committee hearing, um, and they wouldn't have an opportunity really to use their voices in the way that I wanted them to have the experience of using them. Um, so what they chose to work on with some help and guidance with us were issues around sexual assault, campus sexual assault particularly, the rape kit backlog in Texas, which is enormous, um, and then also uh, sex trafficking, which is a huge problem in Texas. Um, Houston is literally like the, the um, capital of sex trafficking in this country. Um, and our high school girls passed a law that created a prevention curriculum around human trafficking in our public high schools in Texas. And then our college young women passed six bills that were aimed at campus sexual assault and also at the rape kit backlog. And this session, they're working on menstrual equity, um, the pink tax. Uh, I took a picture in one of your bathrooms of your basket with the free menstrual products in it. Um, they're trying to, to achieve that as well. Um, they have a very full sexual assault agenda, again, um, because there's still so much that needs to be done in that landscape. And then they're also working on maternal mortality, which is a really big problem in Texas, particularly for African American women there. Um, of the candidates that have decided to run in 2020, which are you most excited about? Gosh, it's such a hard question. I'm spending a lot of time, you know, thinking about this, and I haven't landed anywhere. I'm excited about a lot of these candidates. Um, Beto may join that rank. Um, so I'm just, I'm in a wait and listen approach right now. I want to hear what they're all you know, bringing forward. It was easier for me, um, both in 08 and in 12, I was a Hillary person. Um, I, of course, I got 100% behind Barack Obama in 08 when he came out of the primary, but I was team Hillary all the way for 2012 and traveled all over the country for her. Um, but then it was, you know, the choices were so fewer, right? Um, and now, I. There are a lot of really amazing people that are talking about trying to become our nominees, so. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, a friend of mine and I were talking about um, visionaries versus executioners. Um, she was telling me how she believes someone's going to run for president and they have this vision and they are not going to be an appointee if there is an upcoming democratic um, president because the appointee is simply an executioner. And then we had the discussion about whether or not a balance is needed and can an executioner not be a visionary. And looking at all of your work, um, you seem to have struck a really fascinating balance between the two. Um, and I was wondering kind of what inspires you to do so and how do you keep that? I am an idealist. Um, and happened my whole life. And a lot of that was passed on to me from my father, um, who was very centered around his own ideals as well, and it just kind of filtered. Um, we become idealists when issues become so personally important to us that we can't divorce ourselves. And those deeply embedded values that come from our own personal experiences tend to be ones that we move forward with more passion than we might other things. Um, but I've also always wanted to get things done, too. And as I said earlier, the way the Senate rules operated before it really encouraged you to figure out how am I going to get my colleagues to agree with me on this and to learn how to have those hard conversations. Um, and I think those experiences create really effective leaders. This is why I was Team Hillary all the way, both in 08 and in 12, because I believe that she possesses both of those qualities, someone who 
has a vision and values, but also who has demonstrated time and time again that she knows how to roll her sleeves up and work across the aisle and be effective and get things done. And I don't think we've had that for a while. Um, and that's one thing I'm really going to be looking for in terms of who our Democratic nominee is going to be and who I'm going to try to work to help win the primary and then the general election. Because I think that's what this country needs. Uh, we need both. We want someone who can help us um, tap into the best of ourselves and our hope and our belief that we can do hard things. Um, and it requires a certain, if someone believes those things themselves, then they much more easily can help us to believe those as well and hang on to that through some tough times. But we also want to see somebody who knows how to get in the ring, you know, and be effective. Um, so we'll see. And it's not going to be an easy election. If Donald Trump is a Republican nominee, um, I do not underestimate his ability to win that, that presidency again. So we, we gotta have the right person in there. And when I say we, I mean, I mean the Democratic royal we. I don't necessarily count all of you in that. And wouldn't expect you. Yeah, so I guess like one other question that I had was um, like, I know the Senate map in 2020 for the like US Senate um, involves like, like for the Democrats to retake control would involve like winning races in states that are kind of like more conservative leaning like Texas, such as Arizona or North Carolina. Yeah. Like what kinds of um, like issues or values do you think that those like Democratic Senate candidates should run on in order for um, like the party to retake control of the chamber? I think Beto showed us a really good roadmap of what that looks like. Um, he got, he inspired a lot of people to believe that his ideals were ones that could really help us break through the log jams that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And he did it through authenticity. Um, that is absolutely who he is and what he believes. And when we're off our authentic selves, it shows. If I have any regrets about my 2014 race for governor, it was that I allowed myself to believe that these national pollsters and you know, high paid political people knew more than I did about how to be successful in these big statewide elections. I wish I had trusted my gut more, and I told Beto that when he first started. Yeah. Um, he, his roadmap was one that talked about coming together, that no conversation is too hard and no person should be written off in terms of whether um, they were, were worth talking to and trying to get to consensus with. Um, and a lot of people really, that tapped something for them. And I think he got a lot of Republican support. We'll never know because people don't register as Republicans or Democrats in Texas. We only know if someone's a Republican or a Democrat if they vote in primaries, but a lot of people don't vote in primaries. They only vote in the general. Yeah. So we can make educated guesses at how many people cross the party aisle and voted for Beto as Republicans. Um, I think he had a fair amount of that, and I think yeah. he gained it because he didn't come in with a highly partisan message, although he did not shy away at all from his progressive values. Um, and he really spoke to something that people wanted to hear. And if we're going to succeed in these hard states, I think that's the kind of message that people want to hear. Awesome. That Thank it needs you. to be real. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's going to run for office in this room one day? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there we go. Yes, I ran for office um, for um, Vermont State Legislature last. Fabulous. Are you going to do it again? I may.
I'm weighing, I, I'm a kidney transplant recipient, and I'm 65, so I won't get another one, and I'm halfway through this one, so I'm debating whether or not um, I, I need my bucket list or I run for office. But, yeah, who knows? Thank you for putting yourself out there. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I, I'd also like to say that I'm, I'm a climate activist, mm -hmm. and so I've spent um, most of the week in the Vermont State House. And there's a youth climate lobby up there that's high school students. Yeah. And they are so inspiring. Yeah. And they are reaching their legislators. And that's so right. that's a message to all yeah. of you. You're, you're never too young to go to your state house and get involved. They're, they're rocking it. That's wonderful. And they're changing the discussion. Really, really wonderful. We've definitely seen that in Texas, too, that when our young people sit down at those committee tables and give their testimony that even the crustiest old white Republican <laughs> men sitting up there on those dioceses, they just can't help but be moved by them. You know, they really stop and pay attention to what they're saying. Um, there's, a, there's a power in being young and bringing your stories and your ideas forward, definitely. Well, run we, for office, please. I'd love to see more hands than that in this room when I ask that question. We need you. And we invite you all to, if you're coming to the film tonight, to join us at the after party. There's a post-film reception. So if you're, you're coming to the movie, after the Q&A ends, we're going to wander over to the Visual Arts Center, uh, room 108. And so right after the film, you're welcome to join us for hot cider, bubbles, dessert, and to toast all of the great work that's being done by these amazing yeah. women. So just bring your ticket, it's a private party, so bring your, your ticket for row, and that'll get you in the door, and we'll set you up, and then Wendy will be there along with both the directors, who are alumna, Ricky and Annie, mm -hmm. and Colleen McNicholas, who is a doctor on the front lines, and if you see row, once you see the film, you're gonna be like, okay, here are the heroes. What you're gonna understand is that people like Colleen, the doctor, they are the real heroes. On it takes year. an army. Yeah. It takes it, it takes all of it. It takes a woman willing to stand there for 13 hours and filibuster. It takes all of it. So, so come to the movie, come to the party. Thank you.